Diplomacy Live Podcast Live Welcome to the 10th episode of the Diplomacy Live Podcast. On this episode, again, we're having a conversation with Paul Shari, whose book, Army of None, was the most influential book on uh, autonomous weapons. Paul is one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet on this issue, and we're laying the ground of the basics of this discussion. We will follow up with other episodes that look at swarm technologies and others, but this conversation with Paul is uh, an integral and a very important one to have at this moment. So enjoy this episode. Hello, Paul, and welcome to the Diplomacy Light podcast. Uh, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this uh, again. You know, your book, Army of None, came out at a time when I was starting to prepare for chairing the uh, group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems. And I can say that it was the single most informative uh, piece of literature that I had come across. It was really valuable for me. And I know that uh, traveling around and being in these kinds of meetings has been uh, valuable for a lot of people. But Red, let's really start with, with the basics. Uh, what are autonomous weapons? And if you can perhaps describe them through the three dimensions that, that you mention of autonomy, which is the type of task, the relationship to a human, uh, the sophistication of the machine's uh, decision making, what are, exactly are we talking about? Um, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, very excited to chat with you and, and with listeners. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed Army of None and that it was helpful. Uh, one of my goals in writing it was to inform the experts, uh, the diplomats and others who are working on issues of autonomous weapons, uh, for example, to international negotiations, and also, of course, a wider audience. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you found it useful. Um, so to your question about what is uh, autonomy or what is an autonomous weapon, you know, the idea of an autonomous weapon is really simple. The idea of a weapon that is making its own decisions on the battlefield about whom to kill rather than today, where humans are making those decisions. Conceptually, that's sort of where everyone is in agreement. Now, the problem with that is when you say the word autonomous weapon, people visualize maybe very divergent things. So some pe person might envision, uh, you know, the Terminator from you know, the Terminator movies, and another person might envision a Roomba with a gun on it. And both of those are probably bad ideas, but for very different reasons. And they get at some of this difficulty of the terminology in this space that you kind of hinted at. Um, and so, of course, there is no internationally agreed upon definition of autonomous weapon. Um, it's not because people haven't talked about it. There were discussions underway at the United Nations since 2014. And there have been a lot of areas where, in fact, states have reached consensus on some important principles about autonomous weapons, like they must comply with the law of war and the law of war still applies to them, uh, that humans should be involved at some level. But when you start to get into the technical details, it does get tricky. And in fact, um, one of the things that, you know, was certainly myself and many other experts that worked on this and paid attention to things like definitions. Um, one of the things that, you know, has evolved for me over the years is my definition has changed sort of slightly of what I would use to describe it. Um, I talk in a book about a weapon that can search for, select, and engage targets on its own. Um, the idea that a weapon system could go out into the battle space, it's still, you know, being designed by humans and built by humans and launched by humans for some task, but go out into the battle space, search for valid enemy targets, and then without any further human involvement, find that target identify that it's a valid target based on some programming and then carry out an attack on its own without a human having to, as is the case, generally speaking today, uh, authorize that target. And, um, you know, the, the the term autonomy, though, is, is tricky. You talked about these kind of three dimensions of autonomy that I talk about in the book. And one of the things that's challenging is when we use this word autonomy, people also talk about a spectrum of autonomy, which is, I think, a good way to think about it. Um, but in fact, there's kind of three dimensions to this. It's almost three spectrums. One is the human-machine relationship. So we use terms like semi-autonomous or human in the loop to refer to systems that are going to perform some task, And then they might pause and wait for a human to then take an action to continue moving forward. An example of this might be automated updates on your computer, where it tells you, uh, you know, all you have to do is click a button, you know, go ahead and update. 
And then the computer will do everything on its own. And in fact, it's finding that there is an update for you, but it is waiting for you to make approval so that, for example, you're not, you know, in the middle of a podcast and then your computer decides to do an update and restart itself, right? Very inconvenient. We use terms like supervised autonomous to refer to ones where human is on the loop, where the autonomous system is performing an action all on its own and the human can supervise it and could intervene if necessary, but they don't have to. An example of this is the autopilot in Tesla self-driving cars, where the human is supposed to be attentive, keeping their hands on the wheel, ready to intervene. That's not always the case. We could you know, dig into that further because the human psychology aspect of this is actually a little bit tricky. Um, but the human doesn't need to take any positive action. The human's there to sort of jump in if need be. And then we use terms like fully autonomous or human out of the loop to refer to a situation where the human can't intervene. Uh, an example of a simple automated system like this would be a thermostat when you're not at home. Uh, if you're at home, you're unhappy with the temperature, you can go change it, you're out of your house and something happens, uh, you're not gonna be there for a while. But uh, that might be for a limited period of time and then there's an opportunity for people down the road to intervene. So that's sort of one dimension of autonomy, the human machine relationship. Another dimension is the intelligence of the machine. So I just named a whole bunch of different machines, right? Thermostats, um, self-driving cars, you know, computer software, Roombas, the fictional Terminator, and all of these are varying levels of sophistication. And so we often use terms like automatic, automated, autonomous, intelligent, to refer to the spectrum of sophistication of machines. But one of the things that's challenging is there aren't like sharp lines between these definitions. So I remember sitting at a, at a meeting once with some people in the US Defense Department talking about an autonomous ground vehicle that the military was working on. And there was this lengthy debate about, is it, is it automated or is it autonomous? And the, you know those terms have different sort of meanings. When we think about different levels of complexity, we often use automatic to refer to systems that have a very simple direct um, relationship between the input and the output. Um, Something that's automated might be something that has a greater level of complexity. There's some programming. It's taking multiple inputs and responding necessarily uh, based on, on you know, a multitude of factors. We often use autonomous to refer to something that might be goal-driven, like a car has a goal of driving safely to a destination, but has some degree of freedom in carrying out that goal. We sometimes use the word intelligent to refer to systems that have sort of near human level intelligence for some particular task. But those definitions can be kind of blurry in practice um, and turn out to be a difficult way to sometimes maybe delineate between machines. And then, of course, the most important distinction really is what is the task being performed? Because what uh, a self-driving car is doing or a thermostat is doing or, uh, you know, a, an autonomous weapon is doing are all very different kinds of tasks. They have different consequences if you get them wrong. And... Uh, even within any given machine that has some level of autonomy, we can often automate some of the tasks, but not others. And so a self-driving car is a great example of this, where even a, quote, fully autonomous self-driving car that doesn't have a steering wheel, for example, like some of the cars that Google has worked on, a human is still presumably choosing the destination, right? You're not going to get in the car and say, car, just to take me where you want me to go. Um, the human is still choosing where you want to go. And so there's still some... Uh, delineation between tasks the human is doing and the machine, although that's likely to shift over time as we have more capable uh, and increasingly autonomous machines. So that's, you know, maybe in a nutshell, um, one of the things that's really challenging about the space because the terms can mean so many different terms and they can mean so many different things. Yep. And, and I think that to perhaps the benefit of the GG, I think we've even though we try to define it, we try to go about some of these complexities, we've also found ways of going around it. So, for instance, instead right. of defining it, you know, what are the characteristics of it? You know, what is the human uh, machine interaction? So I think that that's been very valuable as, as, as an approach. Uh, in the end, one of the things that you've hinted at, and I think it is a very important one, is the context. I think that even, even within the deliberations of the GG, 
uh, context has started to come up in the defin not in the definitions but in the descriptions of what is a necess necessity in terms of regulating and banning it whatever the approach may be at the end but context dependent how important is context very important it's very important because certainly um a variety of factors can matter so things like the environment for example are obvious ones where um you know there are some environments where civilians are going to be present and a much greater concern than others certainly uh you know ground combat is going to be one where as we see unfolding in ukraine there are civilians present uh, they can be harmed by military operations that either uh, unfortunately, in many cases, as we happening in Ukraine, are deliberately targeting civilians uh, with Russia committing war crimes or uh, military operations that simply are careless or not taking appropriate precautions that are required under the law of war, or there may be simply accidents. And there are many accidents in different military operations where uh, civilian infrastructure or civilians end up getting accidentally targeted. And there would be other environments where that's not an issue. So, for example, if you had an autonomous weapon underwater, if it's a large metal object underwater, it's going to be a military submarine. Now, it might be your submarine, and that's a problem from a sort of practical standpoint for militaries of avoiding things like fratricide, um, but it's not going to be like a hospital or some other civilian infrastructure underwater. Um, and so I think that's one consideration that matters. Um, when you drill down into even more specific applications, there might be many others that are also really important. So there might be circumstances where an individual is carrying a weapon, um, but is not a combatant because either they're, um, you know, just sort of an individual who's who's a civilian who's armed to protect their property, or they could be, uh, you know, a, a prior combatant who's been rendered or to combat because they've surrendered or they've become injured and incapacitated and they're no longer in the fight. Uh, so those types of contexts are very difficult for machines to understand. Uh, they could even sometimes be difficult for people. So all of those things are really important when we think about autonomous weapons. You know, it has become somewhat of a cliche to describe autonomy um, as the in weapon systems uh, as a third revolution in in modern warfare after gunpowder and and, and uh, nuclear weapons. Does this analogy hold in adequately describing the potential of autonomous weapons? So I think I feel like given someone who wrote a book on autonomous weapons, I should be saying like, yes, it's the third revolution. But I don't I don't actually agree. I think it's overhyped. Um, so you know, I, I think. That's a bold claim, right? That people are making that atomic weapons are as big of a deal as gunpowder or nuclear weapons. And I wouldn't say that. I'm not sure that I agree with that. In fact, um, I think that artificial intelligence overall is probably likely to have very significant effects in warfare over the next several decades. But I still wouldn't compare it to gunpowder and nuclear weapons. I'd probably compare it to. Um, the effect that the Industrial Revolution had on warfare, which was profound and very significant in a variety of ways, um, as we saw industrial age technologies be adopted by militaries. But autonomous weapons specifically, you know, I think it's important when we think about autonomous weapons and think about use cases to compare um, not only what is the value of adding more intelligence into machines, which is a lot. If we could add smarter sensors on machines that can sense the environment and understand it for people, that's incredibly valuable. But what are the circumstances in which we would want to go to full autonomy where there's not a human in the loop, or at least a human in a supervisory capacity? Because the reality is humans still bring a whole lot to the battlefield and to decision making. The best artificial intelligence in the world today is not even close to the cognitive abilities of a human. And the human brain remains the most advanced cognitive processing system on the planet. So there are some circumstances in which we might be willing to trade off the value of human decision-making for automation. Uh, one of those is in speed. And we've already seen in other sectors like stock trading, where there are algorithms making decisions at superhuman speed in competitive environments, the advantage of speed. Uh, there are risks that come from that, things like flash crashes that have come from that, but companies 
particularly driven by competitive pressures, have, have gone to that space operating at machine speed. And there are some narrow domains in warfare where that's happening today, and in fact has been the case for decades, for defensive automated systems like active protection systems on ground vehicles or automated air and missile defense systems for ships or for land bases. Uh, and those have been pretty widely used by countries. There are at least 30 countries that have those in operation today. And again, a very narrow context. Um, there also might be circumstances in which there's a military benefit to full autonomy if you have uh, an uncrewed system, a robotic system operating out on the battlefield, and it needs to perform a task, and you're in a communications denied environment. So one of the things that we've seen, for example, in Ukraine, as we've seen uh, a lot of innovation in the use of drones, is also, not surprisingly, counter drone technologies, <laughs> one of which is the ability to trace the communications link to find the location of the drone operator, to target the drone operator. Uh, which, as you can imagine, is a much more effective tactic than just destroying the drone, which can be easily replaced. And so that's the kind of military competitive dynamic that one can envision might lead operators down the road to say, well, full autonomy is beneficial because then we don't need a communications link and the drone oper operator is not going to be targeted. Um, and so that might be another circumstance where full autonomy is going to be valuable. But I think those are probably going to be fairly narrow use cases. They're worth acknowledging. I think they're real, um, but I wouldn't make such a sweeping claim that that others are making. Maybe I should be, but I don't. I don't really agree. <laughs> well, somebody who might take that position and and make those claims might say to that that well, you know, the the technology that is behind this autonomy, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, generally referred to as. Uh, is not a discrete technology. It's a general purpose technology like electricity, like the combustion engine. So perhaps the revolution that stands behind it is really of, of that nature, like uh, uh, the effect of electricity and combustion engine was on, on an overall frame, not just in security matters. But how has people's understanding that you've, uh, you know, since you first started researching this, how has people's understanding changed over time? How has yours? Well, a ton. Um, and part of it working on this for a while. I mean, I think the comparison to uh, things like electricity, their internal combustion engine, that's a, probably a pretty good one. We're talking about artificial intelligence. Um, and certainly one of the big shifts that we've seen over the last decade or so um, since people have been working on these issues. And it's, you know, it's been about a decade now since autonomous weapons really began to come out um, and grab public attention of uh, diplomats and experts, we saw just over a decade ago, the U.S. Defense Department published its first policy on autonomy and weapons um, that came out in 2012. And Human Rights Watch released their first report raising alarm about autonomous weapons. And then the campaign to stop killer robots was started uh, in the spring uh, following that in 2013. So that Special really sort of kicked off. An extrajudicial uh, killings then as well. Uh, that's right. His... Yep. Sorry. That's right. When Christoph Hans' report came out, um, really, really sparking the discussion uh, at the United Nations, and so it's so about a decade. And, and the big shift, uh, not surprisingly, this happens, but now the technology has been evolving. Uh, that's what you would expect. But what's been interesting is this explosion in deep learning, a particular kind of machine learning that's just taken off in tremendous ways. Uh, I would imagine a lot of listeners have heard of ChatGPT, for example, that just came out a few months ago. And now we're seeing Microsoft and Google and other tech companies lean in hard to uh, large language models like ChatGPT, Microsoft uh, just integrating it into Bing. I uh, really honestly, I don't think I've ever been in a talk where I mentioned Bing, but now it's a, it's a thing and they're, they're, they're going to be competitive again, which is pretty wild. So uh, that space has been evolving in a big way. And that's going to have important implications for militaries as we see machine learning really take off. Uh, in a significant way. You know, in, in, in my own kind of, uh, you know, chairing the GG, et cetera, I noticed a change in the very short time, uh, you know, within months and, and uh, after the first year into the second year even, where how countries, even major military powers, how they were approaching this, you know, and to a degree dependent on uh, on that given country, who was the dominant voice? 
In the beginning, mm. this was a discussion between foreign ministries and defense ministries. And it depended if in that country the foreign ministry was the more dominant voice or the defense ministry was the more dominant voice. And then in certain countries, a new voice started coming up, which is legislative bodies, parliaments. Mm -hmm. And then again, the national positions uh, changed. Have you noticed kind of similar changes in the way it has been approached by countries, by actors uh, over the years? Well, we've certainly seen, of course, national positions evolve considerably uh, over this time frame. It seems like we've gotten to a place where there is more stasis now that a lot of the positions have evolved and they're going to stay in place. Um, I think early on, there was just a lot of uncertainty about what exactly we were talking about. Uh, I remember the first UN discussion before the GG was established in the CCW, and we got to the end of the week and... Um, the the mood this is by my interpretation but the mood that i felt was we got to the very end and a lot of people said what wait so we're not talking about drones at all <laughs> and it was like yeah that's right we're talking about what comes next and people were like oh well what's that and we're like well uh, that's great but we're gonna have to talk about that next year because we ran out of time and so the you know in some ways i think the international community the diplomatic community there's, there's a tremendous amount of credit for leaning into these discussions ahead of a lot of the technology evolving and the popular interest. And so we saw countries coming together through the CCW to talk about autonomous weapons long before they really were on the public's imagination. And um, certainly before we've seen autonomous weapons deployed in any large scale fashion in warfare, which is it's pretty remarkable. Um, and I think uh, just a really incredible testament to those who uh, like yourself and others who've been leading into these conversations. I found your insight, you think you shared it on Twitter a few days ago, uh, on the feeling one must have had when sp first in, in the US, when they first saw Sputnik, uh, you know, uh, orbiting the Earth. Uh, in the example that you had uh, mentioned is the, the current uh, situation with the Chinese spy uh, balloon that uh, has been now taken, taken down. But I think you're describing a, a feeling of vulnerability uh, mm -hmm. that is at, at the heart of it and that in the Sputnik uh, instance, it really uh, started off quite a revolution in the U.S. specifically, which is then shared globally. Uh, you know, NASA came up uh, as a response to that. Uh, ARPA, then, then DARPA, basically was a response to that Sputnik feeling of vulnerability. Do you think that with autonomous weapons, we might have a similarly constructive, uh, perhaps, approach and, and, and the, uh, response from countries? Or is it more probable that there might be some toxic uh, escalations even uh, in, in how this is approached? I mean, I don't know. I think that's a great question. Uh, maybe the answer is both, because, of course, with the Sputnik, that launched a whole way, a generation of investments in science, technology and education uh, here in the United States, innovations like NASA, but also during the Cold War, we got the nuclear arms race. So you know, into the getting getting uh, some of both of those things. I think um, my sense is that many folks working on autonomous weapons have been waiting for a while for this sort of moment when we see autonomous weapons deployed in the real world, um, that it, it certainly feels like something that's likely to be coming um, and could be a galvanizing moment either way. Uh, it's certainly depending on, uh, assuming that happens, depending on you know, how it occurs and what the context is, as you mentioned earlier, who's using it in what situation, whether it's used in a lawful manner or not, whether civilians are harmed or not, uh, could very much shape people's interpretations of the technology and then how others react going forward. One of the things that's been interesting to me, there's another place where my views have shifted over time, is I'm not totally sure that we'll have that sharp moment where we say, aha, this is the first time autonomous weapons have been used in combat. And the reason I used to think that was the case, the reason why I'm, I'm not as sure anymore is we have had a number of use cases already. We start to have some ambiguity. The um, UN report about some uses possibly in Libya a few years ago was a great example of this where this UN report came out, alleged a use of maybe an autonomous weapon, definitely a drone, maybe had some autonomous capabilities, a little bit unclear, Maybe it was switched in autonomous mode. Maybe it wasn't. Yeah. Right. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. And then, like, there's even this sort of ambiguity for a lot of systems where you can look at the developer's website 
and it's like got autonomy written all over it because it's good advertising. But then you're like, well, what does that mean? Like to our conversation at the beginning, like what what exactly is autonomous about the system? Like what features, what functionalities? Sometimes it's not entirely clear. And so that makes me wonder if we may end up in a different world in the future where there is sort of just this, we end up entering this gray space of ambiguity where we could see drones being used, but was it autonomous? Was a person in the loop? We don't know. I think about Sputnik because you could, you could see Sputnik overhead, right? It's a physical object. The challenge with autonomy is you may not know. Um, and that may have very different kinds of dynamics in terms of how people respond. The debate in Geneva has has attracted a lot of attention and a lot of notable names, uh, including AI scientists, but also uh, entrepreneurs, uh, had voiced their opinion and opposition. Um, there is the, the famous Slaughterbot video, which oh, yeah. has uh, millions and millions of, uh, of views, which I have mixed feelings about. And, and, and I know that, you know, it frames in a give just in one aspect and that and that's not necessarily the most constructive one for the debate that we were having. But the aim of that is stigmatization. You know, is, is this, do you think, stigmatization a useful avenue when thinking about international regulation or at the very least some kind of a frame of discussion on autonomous weapon systems? Are there other better paths? I think stigmatization is probably a um, necessary condition for regulation of any kind of weapon. Um, whether, you know, if you look at examples that have been successfully regulated in warfare in the past, things like poison gas, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, landmines, like these are weapons that are seen as beyond the pale for some reason. Civilized nations don't use these weapons. Um, sometimes it's not entirely clear why one weapon should be worse than another. Like why is it worse to be blinded by a laser than to be killed? I'm not sure that I could explain that, but but for whatever reason, certain weapons sort of, there's a stigma about them that develops. Um, I don't think that's the a sort of uh, sufficient condition for regulating weapons. And to some extent, you know, you don't have to work that hard to create a stigma around quote killer robots. Like, yeah. you know, that, that intuitively a lot of people's first reaction to that concept is like, that seems like a bad idea. Like I saw that movie and it did not end well. <laughs> Why would we do that? Um, I think the, the challenge, that's not the challenge, I would suggest when it comes to regulating autonomous weapons, the challenges are things like, how do you clearly delineate what is in and what is out? What would be the distinction? Like, it's easier to regulate chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, because there's this really sharp divide between nuclear and non-nuclear, or chemical and non-chemical weapons. Um, and that's blurry when it comes to things like autonomous weapons. Um, certainly things like verification are much more challenging. How do you verify that others are complying either in development in peacetime or even in wartime? Um, how would you verify whether, you know, another enemy country even is using a human in the loop in wartime? Those are, I think, the practical challenges um, to actually trying to have regulation wherever you think the regulation should fall that might be actually useful and enforceable. I used to think that um, public expenditure was a good frame in addressing this, at least in national uh, public debates uh, about this. But the thing about, uh, I guess, autonomous weapons is that they might be expensive to, to develop, but really cheap to copy. Mm. Uh, and I think that, you know, I had a, a, a podcast recording with uh, Matthew Messelson, who was, who was the guest, and, and he shared this great insight of how he um, the arguments that he used to convince Kissinger, who then convinced Nixon, to uh, unilaterally with, uh, uh, stop its biological weapons program. And that was that a superpower would not want to, do, to have cheap weapons of mass destruction, because that means that many others can have it. And even in this te technology, it seems that uh, you know the major militaries might be at the forefront in developing them, but it might be middle powers who benefit the most in the middle to long term. Hopefully, we get to a middle to long term. But uh, do you think that perhaps this kind of thinking, and, and, and if not, what exactly would be a good argument, like the one that Messelson used um, to ban biological weapons, uh, which have the, you know been described in, the, in, in as repugnant to the, to the conscience of mankind? You know, with this, it's, as you say, much more ambiguous. What is the good frame, the good argument for a proper 
stable development uh, for autonomous weapons? Oh, well, that's a tough. That's a tough question. I thought you were going to ask me about the economics of it, which I completely agree with your analysis. Uh, but you went right for the hard question. But I think the <laughs> let me address the economics one first because it's easier. And I think that's. I think you have it exactly right that there are these um, these factors at play that that are going to make autonomous weapons likely the technology more accessible over time. One is the fact that um, because it's software. Once the technology has been developed, it's basically costless to replicate it. And so that's very different from other types of military hardware, like a fighter jet or a tank, where the marginal cost of building the next thing is actually pretty significant, um, the per unit cost. You don't have that yeah. in this case. Now, you have to build a physical asset, whatever that is, a drone or an undersea vehicle or something else. But to layer on the autonomies, really, maybe there's a little bit of a cost if you need some additional like computer hardware on board, um, but it's going to be pretty marginal, especially because we see costs falling for things like computer chips uh, in such a dramatic fashion. So I think that's a, a real challenge. And in fact, when we look at countries that are able to build just drones today, it's not limited to major military powers. I mean, two of the countries that have uh, the biggest plan in terms of their drones in the Ukraine war are Turkey and Iran. And uh, they're exporting drones around the world. Drones are, of course, widely accessible. We see even civilian drones, you know, small quadcopters and hexacopters, playing a pretty significant role in the conflict. And I would expect that autonomous weapons are even more accessible than drones are today, which is a huge problem for holding them back. Uh, but then, what do you think about how do you how do you make the case? I actually think making the case for sort of why. Uh, handing over control to machines for life and death decisions is fairly straightforward. Why that's maybe not a great idea. I think the main driver, the main concern here, is the competitive dynamic. It's uh, it's what former deputy second, then deputy secretary of defense Bob Work, when he was at the Pentagon, um, had sort of referred to as the the Terminator conundrum. So for paraphrasing, but I talk about this in Army of None that if our adversaries build terminators and they're not as good as human decision making but they're faster how do we respond uh, which is kind of a colorful way to talk about it and a little dramatic but i think that competitive dynamic is very real in a lot of aspects of warfare and and we need to acknowledge that one aspect of autonomous weapons swarms has been described as potentially being a weapon of mass destruction do you think that that it has the potential of uh, being so specifically swarms i am skeptical of that argument. So I think swarms are likely to be over time very significant in warfare. They're likely to be a very disruptive technology in warfare that will change warfare in significant ways. They will open up new tactics for militaries, um, new ways of command and control. But a weapon of mass destruction, that's like that's a pretty bold claim to, to get to that level of destruction. I think one of the things that swarms allow a person to do is scale up the destructive potential that one actor or a small group of actors can do. So instead of one person manually controlling a drone, one person could control a swarm of a large number of drones that could carry out an attack. And so I could envision things like terrorist attacks that use a small swarm of drones, and they might kill more people than they would otherwise do. But scaling up to WMD levels of destruction seems very unlikely to me. That seems like that's a big bar to reach. That was, I think, one of the big problems with the, the Slaughterbots video, among others, was that um, I think it kind of took a valid concept of, okay, drone swarms can enable larger levels of destruction, and then kind of just scaled it up to levels of absurdity that I think are not probably realistic in practice. To perhaps play around with that a, a bit more is that, you know, we, we're talking perhaps of international use between countries. The possibility exists. I mean, even if they develop some are not used in, in international in, in wars, but they're used domestically by countries to control sure. populations. And, and then, you know, then it becomes uh, it goes from one kind of domain of international law into another, which is more human rights uh, law. Do you see such a possibility, perhaps, of, of much more uh, of, of it being used in national context uh, than in international ones? I think in, in principle, it's a very troubling concern because we obviously see uh, many examples of autocratic regimes that hold 
themselves in power through force on the population, oftentimes supported by a minority of the population. And one of the things that autonomous weapons could in principle do is enable an even smaller group of people to enforce their will uh, on a larger population. And we've seen examples in the past, uh, certainly the fall of the Eastern Bloc uh, in 89 is, is one of the most uh, obvious and, and sort of visceral examples of this, where security services simply just decided to lay down their weapons and not fire on uh, the citizens, on their you know uh, brothers and sisters and, and, and neighbors and family members and friends. And when you take away that human element, that's troubling. The idea that when you replace that human standing there, you might say, you know what, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to support this government anymore. I'm not going to shoot these protesters with now a machine. I think that does raise really troubling questions about um, domestic applications of autonomous weapons. Now, if we're being honest, those are probably pale in comparison to the ways that we see surveillance technology already being used in places like China and then exporting globally to just monitor populations using, in large part, AI to track people, identify faces, monitor their movements, see where they're going, where if that technology is used effectively, protesters don't even get to the square. They don't even make it to the point where you have a large protest because, um, in theory, a regime, and certainly the Chinese Communist Party is building this inside China now, uh, is able to track would-be protesters or dissidents and crack down on them before even that kind of large protest can evolve. No, autonomous weapons have maybe used on land, um, on and underwater, in, uh, uh, in space, uh, even in cyberspace. And perhaps I've missed it, but I haven't seen enough discussion of this last part of cyber uh, autonomy in cyberspace, of cyber weapons that have autonomy uh, within them. And within, as you said uh, earlier, within cyberspace, there's enough of a gray zone. It's not always clear what's an act of war and what isn't. Mm -hmm. Does this have the potential of increase that gray zone and make it even more ambiguous, uh, dangerously so? What do you see as the development in autonomy in, in cyber warfare? Well, it's probably one of the most significant areas where I would agree we definitely need more attention paid to um, and uh, could end up being a place where we see some of the more early applications in part because it is a, a native uh, digital environment for machines, right? So you don't have to have the challenges of robots navigating their way through the physical world in cyberspace. And of course, many forms of malware already have high levels of autonomy. So the very first internet worm, uh, the Morris worm, you know, spread by itself, replicates by itself, that's what worms do, onto other computers, um, many forms of malware then carry out an attack on their own, uh, finding their target. Some of them, of course, quite sophisticated malware like Stuxnet, um, navigating through computer networks, finding the right type of computer and then carrying out uh, its attack. And so that's a space where there's already actually like a lot of autonomy and automation and there's potential as we see more sophisticated forms of malware for all sorts of troubling things. Uh, one of the things that I'm certainly concerned about in that space is the potential for accidents. Uh, that's what the first internet worm was. The worst one was actually an accident. And we've seen in many sophisticated forms of malware today, uh, Stuxnet is a good example of this, has um, many multiple types of safeties in place to prevent excessive proliferation or attacking the wrong target. But one can envision systems that don't have this, that then spiral out of control, or just actors who like don't care and want to wreak havoc, causing widespread destruction with either uh, on the internet or internet-enabled devices, which of course is increasingly many things uh, that are really critical to modern life are connected to the internet. And so I think that's an area that uh, we may see more troubling developments in terms of autonomy in cyberspace. It might be harder to figure out is this, quote, an autonomous weapon, in part because of these distinctions about use of force and what is a weapon in cyberspace, um, but this intersection of cyber operations and cyber offense and defense and autonomy is certainly a concerning one. You know, of the three dimensions we started off our, our conversation with, um, there is one 
dimension that has really taken up a, a lot of focus. You know, a lot of delegations in, in civil society, academia has honed in on this human machine uh, interaction as perhaps the one around which a uh, discussion can, can be had. Uh, a phrase has come up, the meaningful human control. Oh, yeah. uh, the idea behind it is norm creation, really, if one looks at it. Right. It is to, to develop a specialized law. Uh, and as you know, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand a specialized law supersedes general law because and then that can create some difficulties of its own because then it has to be really precise, right? What, what, mm -hmm. What's your what's your thinking on, on this uh, concept, uh, potential norm, meaningful human control? Well, I think we are seeing this process of norm development uh, that you talked about underway with uh, meaningful human control and then other competing versions of this terminology, because, of course, the term meaningful human control is a loaded term in large part because many of the people who are using that term and advocating for it are also saying that uh, they want to ban autonomous weapons. In fact, I've certainly seen uh, people from the NGO community say meaningful human control equals ban autonomous weapons. So as long as you conflate those things, there are going to be some states that are like, I don't like the term meaningful human control. But what's interesting is what others are putting forward in response is not no human involvement. It's just a different sort of label. Well, we think, you know, there should be appropriate human involvement or uh, the U.S. uses the term appropriate human judgment. There's all the different flavors that necessary human involvement, um, you know, sort of blank human blank. Um, I'd say setting aside what brand you want to use, that idea that at some level humans should be involved should be something that states should explore further and try to better understand. And in fact, uh, that was basically encapsulated in some of the consensus principles that have come out of the GGE. And so to me, you know, debating the terms kind of don't mean as much, particularly because none of these terms are defined in any widespread way that people agree upon. Um, but a more fruitful avenue would be probably to say, okay, look, if we all agree that at some level humans should be involved, what does that look like? And I can see a couple avenues for approaching that. So one avenue could be to say, well, what have humans been doing in the past? Let's just try to better map out when we see weapons employed today, particularly more technologically sophisticated weapons, how are humans employed? And it's not, I, I'm saying going beyond simply saying, well, humans are in the loop, sure. But what are those humans doing? How much information do they have about the battle space? What is their decision-making process? And that's like not a valuable sort of baseline to establish. And I'll be honest, I've seen definitions of meaningful human control that don't match what militaries do today. Um, I've seen definitions that would render, you know, weapons going as far back as the catapult band under the definition, which, you know, seems probably not very workable if that's how you're thinking about the degree of human involvement that's required. Um, so that's like one, one approach. Another one that is probably particularly valuable would be to approach this from the perspective of the law of war and say, well, what are the minimum necessary requirements under the law of war for human involvement? And that's, I think, a really interesting question to explore, in part because it's not explicitly written down anywhere in the law of war, but it's, of course, implicit in almost everything because we've had humans making those decisions to date. One of the things that's intriguing to me is the U.S. Defense Department's official position in their law of war manual is that only humans are legal agents, that an autonomous weapon does not have legal agency any more than uh, an assault rifle would or a shovel. And only humans can then make sort of determinations about lawfulness. And autonomous weapons are tools then to carry out, for example, an attack. Now, if one adopts that perspective that only humans have legal agency, which to be fair, is a, that's a choice, but I think it's a valid one, then it's worth asking like, well, what flows from that? Uh, I think certainly one argument that could be made is that it's a responsibility of combatants to know that the actions they are taking are lawful. To know that if they are participating in an attack or ordering an attack, that that's a lawful attack. And what is the minimum information then that a person requires to do that? So a, a sort of thought experiment that's often given about meaningful human control is, well, what if we have this person uh, sitting in a trailer 
and they're looking at a light and when the light goes on and it's green then they push a button to carry out an attack and that's all the information the person has so the person is technically in the loop but they have no meaningful human control of the situation they have no actual understanding of what's what they're doing and um that's a that's kind of an interesting way to start the conversation about human involvement because it does seem like well that's probably not what we're looking for um and then you can start asking okay well how much information should that person have uh, in order to know that pushing this button and launching an attack is a lawful decision? Now, we don't require people today sitting in the cockpit of a fighter jet or the console of a ship or in an air and missile defense system to have like visual eyes on a target. Um, that's not required. Sometimes they're looking at information mediated through some technology like a radar, for example, but we still expect that they have enough information to know that that's a valid enemy target and the action they're taking is lawful. And of course, all of the um, regulations in the law, or many of them at least, uh, operate at the level of an attack, things like precautions in attack. And so that sort of raises interesting questions I think are worth exploring about, well, um, not only how you define that, but what level of human involvement do you really need to ensure that humans are operating in a lawful manner? I think it's very beneficial that the discussion in Geneva happened within the CCW because it allowed exactly this, you know, to use the language of international humanitarian law, the law of war. Uh, and, you know, it allowed for exactly exploring how would precautions in attack be done? How is it to, how in an evaluation whether this is an indiscriminate attack or not, uh, et cetera, military necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you describe in your book, the different motivations that are uh, perhaps uh, useful in past uh, approaches to different weapons in regulating them or in arms control. Uh, some have been more successful than others. And, you know, some have the motivations have ranged from strategic stability to, you know, unnecessary suffering, civilian suffering. But at the end of the day, military utility is is a very important motivation in, right. in, in, in right. how that is a, a, approached. So how do you think that you know, you've as well described kind of principles, you know, that might be stabilizing? You know, if you shoot at a robot, expect it to shoot back. And you've said that this can be a stabilizing effect. Are there other such principles where there can be some agreement uh, of rules of the game? Yeah, I think that is um, a really important question going forward. Um, one of the things that uh, that I talk about is what you mentioned, this idea of concerns about autonomous systems interacting in peacetime or in crises and avoiding unintended escalation among them. And so some kind of rules of the road or code of conduct governing those uh, their behavior is like a really important thing to explore. A good analogy there would be the uh, U.S.-Soviet 1972 Incidents at Sea Agreement, which was successful in reducing um, problematic air and maritime encounters between the U.S. and Soviet militaries. And so something analogous to that, like an autonomous incidents agreement, might be one such approach. I do think on the nuclear side, among nuclear armed states, some agreement for putting in a minimum threshold for human involvement in nuclear launch decisions seems like a really important one. Um, it does seem like a place where, you know, if there's any place that we should agree on, it should be that humans should remain in control of nuclear weapons use. That seems like a pretty low bar to clear. The U.S. government actually has included a statement affirming this in the 2022 Nuclear Posture Review. And uh, if listeners haven't seen it, I would certainly encourage people to check it out. It is official U.S. government policy now. Um, but I'm not aware of any other nuclear armed powers stating that. And of course, we've seen historically some concerning applications, things like the Soviet perimeter semi-automated dead hand system. There's a lot of different reports about its um, functionality and the extent to which it was operational, if ever. And so there are conflicting reports about that. But whatever they amount to, it's a troubling concept to have uh, even a semi-automated dead hand system like it was purported to be, where a person was still... Uh, in the loop, but launch authority would be delegated under certain circumstances to a very low level officer. And those are things that I think are certainly worthy of uh, states coming together to try to reach agreement around. I think there are similar concerns about nuclear delivery systems. 
uh, that might be recoverable and autonomous. So obviously we've had things like missiles that are one way that are nuclear armed, that nuclear armed states have had. But now as we see more capable drones or undersea systems that could go out on patrol, that raises difficult questions about for those that might be um, armed, whether they might be nuclear armed, and if so, how states were thinking about using them. I don't think that's a great idea. I think that we should have an international agreement to retain positive human control over nuclear weapons, not just the launch, but even on platforms, their physical access uh, right up until the point of, of launch. And so things like uh, an autonomous undersea vehicle or drone that's nuclear armed, I think is something that, that we should have an international agreement not to do. And then certainly in conventional applications of autonomous weapons, I would personally think that some agreement among states about what level of human involvement do we need, um, whatever the term is that people want to use, but going down and really trying to put more fidelity on from a law of war standpoint, how much human involvement is required would be really beneficial and a helpful guideline for states as they're um, dealing with difficult questions about this technology going forward. There's a brilliant scene in Dr. Strangelove where uh, there, there's the communication of that uh, the launch is automatized if there's a perceived threat. And, you know, there's a saying, you know, if you have something like that, the point is to say that you have right. it, right? So right. it's, <laughs> but, you know, let's let's end with where your book uh, begins, with Stanislav Petrov, with instances, and unfortunately, there have been many. Uh, on the U.S. side, Brzezinski has been in a situation to, uh, you know, be informed that there's an imminent attack, you know, that and to be able to do we respond, do we launch uh, automatically? Luckily, cooler heads from Petrov to Arkhipov to Brzezinski have said, no, no, let's see what this is all uh, about. And yet you keep on hearing from time to time a voice uh, in different nuclear powered countries that there should be autonomy uh, in, in strategic weapons. You know, what's I mean, there's a lot of possibilities here, you know, autonomy in the early warning systems, autonomy, perhaps in the the, the launch. Uh, but where does the dust settle here? You approach this a little bit, but uh, where, where you've, you've said that, you know, some kind of an international uh, agreement is is necessary. Is it possible? I think it's certainly possible. And we have seen, I think, throughout the history of arms control, that in fact, states have repeatedly come together to reach agreement on uh, not just the number of nuclear weapons, but also their deployment posture, or even strategically relevant systems that might threaten, for example, a state's nuclear deterrent. So I think it's definitely possible. Um, it's safe to say that the international climate at the moment among great powers is not a great one for arms control, but there's still value in looking for those opportunities, trying to better understand what an agreement would look like laying the foundations um, for states to come together to do that. I think it's really essential to do so. Paul, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and insights and incredible wisdom that uh, ha is based on a lot of research and a lot of thinking on these issues. Thank you for coming on the Diplomacy Light podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed the discussion. Diplomacy Light podcast. Light.